Would you please open your Bibles to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. I'll be reading verses 13 through 19. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judge, judges every man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that is what is not permissible, perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And the church said, Amen. Thank you, Phil. It's great to see everybody today. And it's great to see all those other people out there today. So there may be a lot of those who are at home watching and uh, we're just glad to have whoever turns, tunes in. Uh, just one announcement for you. There's a widow's or there was a widow's luncheon this week. That's going to be canceled. Just they're fairly high risk. I mean, they're ornery, but they're high risk. So <laughs> they're uh, going to cancel that luncheon. So this was thought of long before we ever had viruses going around and everything else. So just this is part of what God wants is he calls us to be holy. And it's one of those things that I think is kind of lost in our world today. We make fun a lot of what's holy. We have a very irreverent attitude. We don't think of reverence toward God. We don't treat very many things as precious or important. And yet this is one of the things that he calls us to do. He calls us to be holy like he is holy. And Peter is maybe one of those people who had done that before. He was a fisherman. He was in the world. And once he knows Jesus and understands who Jesus is, it changes him completely. And so he writes here, prepare your minds for action. I like that. Well, how do we prepare our mind for action? Knowing that we're preparing our mind for action of being holy. Okay. I guess we, you know, sit quietly, fold our hands, and prepare. I think it ought to be the other way around because this ought to be something that's huge, ought to be something that's exciting. It ought to be, let's get ready to be holy, right? Isn't that the way you would say it if you were really talking about what God does to make us holy? I mean, forget rumble, let's do holy. Wow, that would be amazing to watch what he does with all of these things. He says, set your hope on the, on the grace that is coming as obedient children. Don't follow ignorant passions. It's the passions of your ignorance. But I want you to be holy that God has called us to be holy, to be these people who are good and pure and set apart and different from all the others. Because God is that way. And that's the reason that he gives you here is because he's that way. But this is not the only place in Scripture that talks about this. There are a number of different places. And he says, well, it was in Scripture. Moses and so he talks about this as a part of who we are. One of those is found in Leviticus chapter 19. And so let me just share with you a little bit of what Leviticus 19 is about as he talks to the people about what God said. And so 
The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And every one of you shall revere your mother and father and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make yourself idols of cast metal. I am the Lord your God. And when you offer a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord, you shall offer it so that you may be accepted. And so it looks like that's what he's doing here. He's going through and giving them a whole bunch of things that what you would do in order to be holy. And it's not just sit around. It's maybe a way in which you look at life. It's a way in which you would accomplish things. And so he expects us to be holy like him. It's in the way you treat mom and dad. Ouch. Maybe that's a little bit difficult, but that's what he says. It's in the way you treat mom and dad. It's in the way you keep your day of worship. For them, it's Sabbath. For today, it's Sunday. And so it's about that. It's about your worship of idols or, or your making of idols. And certainly there are things sometimes that we put above God and that we would honor more than God. He says, don't pay attention to your life and to what you're doing that it might be holy. When they offer sacrifices or when they pray, it needs to be in an acceptable way or in a way that makes God accepted, that pleases him and does those things. And so we need to be able to get worship right. We need to act right. We need to honor God. We need to, to show God that we want to be his holy people in our, in our behavior, in our conduct. He goes on to talk about this. He says, leave some of the edges of your field. If you followed further down in that chapter, he says, don't take everything. Leave some for the poor. Okay, uh, don't steal, don't deal falsely, don't lie, don't uh, swear falsely by God, don't oppress your neighbor, don't take advantage, don't pay a day's wage, but keep the money all night. Say, well, you work today, but, you know, it's still the day, and I'll give it to you tomorrow. Well, what's the difference? It might be a lot of difference if he doesn't have dinner for that night. And, and so he's saying, I want you to deal with people in a, in a kind way. I want you to be holy in the way in which you do this like God is. And so don't look for loopholes that give you advantage. Don't, here's, here's one that he says, don't curse the deaf. Why would you do that? They can't hear you anyway. I mean, it makes no sense. Or don't put a stumbling block in front of a blind man. Well, okay, yeah, that's just cruel. And so don't be partial to one side or to the other. Be an honest person. Be a good person. And so he's giving you some of these things that are maybe how you would be holy. But he says this is what it really comes down to. Is being able to recognize that it follows in our actions. It follows in the things that we do. It follows in the attitude that we have. And the way in which we would reach out to people. And so it's in everything that we would do and that we would say and the way in which we would approach them. And so I think that's an important thing to realize that that's what Peter's talking about. And if you go back to the first Peter again, part of what he had recognized here as he writes all of this, he talks about being holy as we are holy in all your conduct. And so that's what Leviticus was talking about is about your conduct. And then verse 17, and if you call on him as father, he says, realize that you're calling on him as father. And so make your conduct good. Did your father ever tell you that there's a certain way to do things? Or that some things in which you did are not acceptable? I had some of those kinds of instructions when I was growing up. And that uh, there's a way that you're supposed to do it and a way that you're not supposed to do it. And so he would tell me, here's the thing I want you to do. It later dawned on me it was very advantageous to do it the right way. And his way, it was a whole lot less painful. And so that's what happened, though. I mean, he's father. And so would we expect anything different from God? If you're going to call him father, 
you got to expect that kind of relationship, that he's going to love you enough to say, I'm not going to let you act that way, son. You're going to do better than that. And so it's one of those things that we learn how to do. He talks about this as being respect for God and that we were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ. That's amazing to me. The ransom price should determine the conduct is what he's trying to say. And so if you were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ, then that ought to make a difference in how the person who is ransomed is would act. And so when you look at that, it's, it's one of those amazing, amazing things. But a, a, ransom is, a ransom is about when like somebody kidnaps somebody and they hold you for ransom. And who gives the price of the ransom? It's always the kidnapper, isn't it? Not in this case. It's not Satan who gives the price. It's God who gives the price. He says the price that will be paid for this is the Son of God. The death of the Son of God. It's going to be a complete, total price. It's going to be everything that could possibly be given. It's not like you're going to get a bargain on somebody. He says the ransom price is from God who sets the price as the precious son of God. It isn't what we think we're worth. It's what God pays. It isn't that the way it always works. Things are worth whatever people will pay. I see the price of toilet paper going up <laughs> in a huge way, don't you? I mean, whoever has the market on that is going to be... It's going to be amazing. Uh, so what is the price of things? If you have a painting, what's the price of the painting that you have? Well, it's whatever people would pay for it. It's probably 20 bucks in materials, right? You got a canvas and you got some paint that you put on there, but it wasn't a whole lot of paint. It's just a little bit here and there, kind of on there. And uh, it's not like you're getting a bunch of paint. Because we don't think of paintings that way. The more paint on the canvas, the better the value. No. It's where you put it and how it looks. And, and sometimes it's like that. The price of gold. What's the price of gold? Well, I guess this is dating me because when I was growing up, the price of gold was $35 an ounce. Okay. Pretty good. I mean, we used to think about that. We could go out and pan gold and get some money. And there were people who tried to do that. I don't know if they ever really got much. Well, today it's $1,534.25. Of course, that may be down since the stock market has fallen like crazy. But that would be the price of gold. So the price is much higher now than what it was back then. If you look at different prices for the price of a new home now, in 1930, a brand new house that you could buy was $3,845. That was the average price. Of course, there were deals. In 2013, which is the last figures I have, it's $289,500. Why is it worth more? Is it a better house? Closets are bigger. Average wages in 1930 was $1,970 for the year, not for the week or for the month. In 2012, it was 44325 Average cost of a new car in 1930 was $600. 2013, it's 31,352. The average cost of a gallon of gas in 1930 was 10 cents. In 2013, it was three dollars and eighty cents. We're doing good. It's cheaper than that now, so it's a bargain. Just go out and buy extra gas at least. The cost of a loaf of bread in 1930 was nine cents. Now it's, in 2013, it was $1.98. That goes up and down as well. Hamburger was 12 cents, and 
1930, and today it's this price in 13 was four dollars and 68 cents. Maybe you can get it at a better deal. So the whole point is things have gone up incredibly. So does your salvation cost more? If you had repented of your sins in 1930, would God have gotten a good deal? Because, you know, he could have gotten you for a whole lot less, right? Isn't that the point? Because now we have gone up so much more. No, it really isn't. It's the fact that it's the same. Jesus paid everything, all of it. It isn't like it was a bargain back then. It took all. And today it takes all, whatever it is. And it's his life. And so it's total. It's complete. I think we need to realize that and see what things are really worth. Because they are worth what God can make out of them. Right? They're not worth what we see. They're worth what God can make out of them. And so if you have a car that can be restored, is it worth more before it's restored? Aren't the prices the same? It's the same car. It's the same metal. The weight of the car is the same. Well, actually, you might get more weight with the dirty one because it's <laughs> kind of dirty. It can go from junk to brand new. It can go from junk to many thousands of dollars. Well, what made the difference? Well, somebody took the time and restored it. Do you think maybe people can be like that? That God can take them when they're junk. And they have messed up their life so much that they don't really have much. And there's really not much that they have to offer. And that he can restore them to be holy. To be something that is far above what they ever could have been on their own. To be someone that absolutely is truly holy like God. So let me ask you, are you worth more when you're sick? Or when you're not sick? If you get sick with this coronavirus... Well, we don't want you, right? Please stay home. You can watch on the streaming. But it's not that we don't want you. It's not that God doesn't want you. So what is the value once we're sick? How much worth do we have? Are we worth more? Well, no. Are we worth less? No. Why not? Obviously, we're going to produce less. Obviously, we're going to do less. Obviously, we're not going to be out. We're not going to feel good. We're not going to be around people. We're probably not even going to be nice. I don't know how you are when you're sick, but a lot of times it just takes away all the niceness out of it. So I want you to think about for a little bit, because we just have to talk about this. If you've come in contact with this coronavirus, you may not even know. But I'm glad all of you are here to say, you know what, I'm not sick. I mean, it's allergy season and the orange blossoms on our tree just came out. And so, yeah, there might be a few Kleenexes floating around, but uh, know where it is. It can be spread, but it isn't in the blood to have to worry about a mosquito that bites you. It isn't in the air other than if you cough or sneeze, it might be in the air so basically, it's airborne for as far as you can spit. That's what it is. And so it's airborne, but it's not like a gas that, you know, if you put sarin gas in here, it's killing everybody three blocks away. It isn't quite like that. And so we just have to understand what it is. And it can infect people who come in contact with it. And if you're afraid of it, by all means, take precaution. And I'm not going to say whether somebody should or shouldn't or what you're supposed to do about it. If you feel like you're at risk, then by all means, take precaution and be careful. And there are some people who are 
older and weaker and have some other kinds of disease already that really do need to protect themselves. I mean, that's true of the flu or any other thing going on. And, and it, whether it's a coronavirus or any other kind of virus, I want you to be safe. And by safe, I'm going to say whatever you think safe means. And so just take care of yourself and realize that's what happens. But it might be helpful today for us to look at what happens when Jesus runs into coronavirus. It wasn't really called coronavirus back then. Um, The communicable disease was called leprosy. And so look at Mark chapter 1 and verse 40, and let's see how Jesus dealt with this, because it was contacted by touch. They quarantined these people away from everyone else. They were not allowed to be around anyone else. They lumped them together and said, you guys can stay together, but it literally did some damage to their flesh and would even eat it and cause it to fall off. That's a bad virus. That's a lot more than a cough. And yes, it was deadly, and there was no cure. And so their cure was to quarantine. Does it sound familiar? It's exactly what we're doing today. And so this says, And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer for a cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. And he went out and he began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in the desolate places, and the people were coming out to him from every quarter. Wow, that's an amazing thing. And the people who were coming out to him were probably the sick people, because they had heard about this. They had heard there's a guy who can heal all of this, and so they were coming out. It starts off by saying a leper came to him. No, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to stay in your quarantined area, and please don't get out of there. But actually, this must mean he had some faith in Jesus, that he could come to Jesus because his first statement is even if if you're willing, you could make me clean. I already know that. I'm not putting you at risk. You are not in any danger because I know you could make me clean. So I think he believed a lot. He comes to Jesus and he shows himself saying, you could do this. And Jesus knew, or he knew that Jesus had the power to heal and accepted that it might not be that Jesus would heal. If you will, you can make me clean. Understanding that you may not want to, because after all, I'm just a leper. And Jesus' response is that he is moved with pity. He feels for the sick. Even though I doubt Jesus himself has ever been sick. After all, he can heal all diseases. He is always aware of suffering, however. And much of the time, diseases are about suffering. While his may not be about disease, he does understand suffering. What Jesus does is reach out and touch him. He didn't have to. It isn't as if he has to touch every single time, but there are times when he on purpose does this and he touches him, he touches his disease. And that's what Jesus does. Just to say there's no disease I can't defeat. Now, I'm not asking you to go do this. All right? But that I want you to realize that Jesus is able to defeat any disease that comes along. The worst, most communicable disease of their time, Jesus touches it, allows people to come to him, goes where it is. 
because he can defeat any of them. He said, I will be clean. And then sends him away to the priest, and the priest has a way of pronouncing a final, yes, you're clean, yes, you're well. If you ever did get well of leprosy, that's what you had to do because you were not allowed to be part of society. And that would allow you, since you presented yourself to the priest, to be back into society. And so what an amazing thing that would be. So I believe Jesus can heal all disease. Every single one of them. It doesn't really matter what it is. All disease. And coronavirus is nothing compared to what Jesus can do. But healing every disease won't save them. That's a temporary thing. It might help us not be scared. Not be scared of being sick and not being scared of death. And I also believe that if Jesus wills, he could forgive all sin. And it might be more critical to forgive sin than to heal disease. And what I want you to realize is where you are today. Is that we don't really have it because you guys are the ones who came. And so we don't really have any disease. But you already have sin. Every single one of you has been infected with sin. There isn't a single person here without it. You're not in danger. You're already way past danger. You've already got it. And there's only one cure, and that's the blood of Jesus. And Jesus tries to teach people that in the next chapter, in Mark chapter 2, and when he deals with the paralytic. It says, and when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And then when he, they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. That's an amazing statement to me. Because they did not come to get sins forgiven. They had gone to great lengths trying to be able to get to Jesus, taken the roof off even, come so that he could heal him of his paralysis. And Jesus forgives his sin. And there's a reason why he does that. They came for healing. Jesus says, I think you need to realize there's a bigger problem. And so he continues with that. Now some of the scribes who were sitting there questioned in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus perceived in his spirit that they questioned within themselves. He said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are, to, are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up the bed and went out before them all, so that they were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw Anything like this. What a tremendous thing. Jesus is simply showing that if he can heal disease, he can heal sin. Which one's worse? Which one's more important? I don't think we need to answer that. Both are bad. But it's sin that's killing us. That's the thing we need to be praying about. I mean, we need to pray about virus also and about people getting sick and all of that, but that's the thing that's bad. Jesus heals sin, but he also heals paralysis. But it's sin that's ruining relationships. It's sin that's destroying our value. It's sin that says, well, you're not worth anything anymore because look at all the bad things you've done. 
How can you have any value? And sometimes we will even buy into that. Jesus says, why do you question things in your heart? Why do we question? What are we going to question? Well, is it going to be what happens in the world? What about this coronavirus? What's going on? Can Jesus heal it? We're going to have extra Clorox wipes or extra prayers. Which one do we need? Maybe both. Jesus' point is I can heal disease, I can heal sin. And if he can stop you from getting sick, he can heal your sin and whatever other issue. And if you pray and you don't get sick, please don't feel lucky. Realize he's the one that healed you. He's the one that kept you safe. And isn't that why we came anyway? To realize that that's what Jesus does and that's what he's able to do. People get sick and it may not be because of sin at all. And so I'm not in any way suggesting that only the sinful people got sick. Okay, I realize that there's the rest of us here too. And yeah, we all need to be forgiven. That's the place where we are. And even if you're watching at home, you can still be forgiven at home. You didn't have to get here for that to happen. And maybe we can avoid coronavirus. And maybe we can quarantine from sin as well. Isn't that what he talked about in the beginning? Isn't that what he said to be holy? Is that I want you to stay away from all these other things. From the way in which you had lived your life, from the way in which you see all this behavior and, and conduct. And so in all of your behavior and conduct, I want you to stay away from things that are sinful. Do the things that are right. Do the things that are pleasing to God. Be these honest people. And so God wants you to be holy like he is holy. And how do we do that? Well, we do that by having our sins forgiven. We do that because God is able to take away sin and God is able to take away disease and God is able to do everything. And so make sure you're not more afraid of disease than you are of sin. It is much more deadly. Maybe we need to start with Jesus healing our sin. That's really the place it begins, isn't it? Because let me just ask you, if you're going to pray to God which I think this does. It drives us to pray to God because it is scary and lots of people can be infected and lots of people can get sick. And so we do need to pray to God. But if you're going to pray to God about a virus, would you not mention your sin? Would you not ask forgiveness? Well, I don't need that, God. I just need this virus thing, God. And my other question is if we knew that Jesus would heal every single person who repented of sin and give him immunity from every virus, wouldn't the church be full? But we don't quite believe that one. We need God. And God calls us to be holy. And there's a lot of bad things that happen in the world. Some of them are physical. And they can scare us to death. Like a virus that goes around that can be transported just by touch. And some of the things are things that we've done to ourselves. That we need Jesus to forgive us. And it's an amazing thing that because of the death of Christ, we can be buried in waters of baptism and be raised to walk a new life. And our sins are completely washed away. They're not here anymore. They are completely gone. And Jesus has healed us from our sin. And we'll trust he can do the rest of that too. So let me just ask you today when you pray that you would pray for both. You have not had the chance to be baptized into Christ, to be healed of your sins.